So before we left, we were talking about reacting systems and reacting system balances, and we've been easing into it a little bit. Uh, this week is where we'll start to get into uh, a lot of the details of how we do these calculations, and then, uh, then we'll be doing a lot of example type problems, kind of how we did with uh, phase equilibria. Once we introduced it, then we kind of took a step back, went through a lot of examples. Uh, we'll do the same thing with the reacting systems as well. Uh, today, though, we're going to talk about a concept called Hess's Law. S's, I guess it's a lot of S's. Uh, basically, this is all this is is the same concept that we've been talking about in thermodynamics so far, in that everything we're doing is path independent. And so far, we've viewed path independent along the lines of I can change the temperature first or the pressure first, or vice versa. In the case of Hess's law, we can just totally rearrange all the chemical bonds as well. So in Hess's law, the concept here is that all we care about is the final bonding, sorry, the initial to the final. So we can break apart any molecule we want in any particular way. We can choose any reaction pathway that we want to choose as long as we get from the initial configuration to the final configuration of not just temperature pressure, but also of the chemical bonds themselves. So for example, we'll get into some more details of, of real systems. If we have a reaction system, right, we have A plus B going to C, a very nice elementary reaction. And this will have some heat of reaction one. Then we can have C plus B goes to E, maybe that's the product that we're actually looking for. This can have some heat of reaction or reaction two. Hess's law says that we can just manipulate it as much as we want. So in this case here, let's just add them together. If I add these together, the C cancels out. I add the Bs. So I have A plus 2B goes to E. And now the delta H of this reaction here is just adding them together, right? I added these two reactions. And this is the basis for how we more or less perform all balances on reacting, sorry, all energy balances on reacting systems. So with Hess's law, we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, we can, do, we can manipulate reactions as much as we want. We can scale this by a factor of two, we can divide it by a factor of two, we can do any manipulation we want. All that we have to do is make sure that we do the same corresponding operation to the heat of reaction. And this will allow us to basically manipulate bonds any way that we want and get us from a final configuration, initial to a final configuration. So as a few more examples, if we, let's say, are same reaction again. Let's just say it has a delta H of minus 100 kilojoules per mole. If I wanted to do the reverse, and so let's say C goes to A plus B, delta H in this case is positive 100. I can multiply it by 2, so 2A plus 2B goes to 2C, and delta H here would be minus 200. Now remember, when we say per mole, this is like per one extent of reaction, going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So if I double the reaction, I double the delta H, but I also modify all the stoichiometric coefficients. All right, so my, my, my extent of reaction will be all scale out, so it works out just fine mathematically. Now, one of the best uses of Hess's law is trying to understand the thermodynamics of reactions that are extremely hard to do. So the best example of that is forming carbon monoxide. So this 
is a reaction that we really can't control very easily. It happens, but it's not one that we can just spontaneously say, I only want to make carbon monoxide. And so it's difficult for us to measure this. So who's familiar with calorimetry? Should be an experiment that most, most people have done in some form in a chemistry class. So how these experiments are actually done is I would put, in this case, carbon, I would put oxygen in a little, they call it a bomb calorimeter. You ignite it, and then you measure how much energy comes off. And typically how you measure how much energy comes off is you're surrounding it by a reservoir, and you measure how much the temperature changes in that reservoir. If you know what the properties are, you can deduce how much energy, <coughs> excuse me, how much energy was released. Now the problem with that idea, if we're going to go and do this in the lab, if I'm burning carbon and pure oxygen, I'm not forming CO2, right? I'm going to be forming, sorry, I'm not going to be forming CO, I'm going to be forming CO2. So with Hess's law, we, we can figure out how the energetics of this reaction go on. So instead, what we would do is we break it up into two steps. One, we would form CO2, and we can measure its heat of reaction to be very energetic, minus 394 kilojoules per mole. And that makes sense. We would expect this to be a really, really negative number. The CO2 is an extremely stable compound. The next step is we would, you know, maybe find some other way to make a little bit of CO, purify it, and then burn it in oxygen to make CO2. Measure this delta H of reaction. And then with Hess's law, we can figure this one out. So what manipulation should we do? Could you uh, make that positive? positive and then cancel out your CO2s? Yes, so which, which way am I doing this here? So give me a linear, linear operations for these reactions. Which reaction should I add, subtract, you know, all subtract that? Subtract the bottom reaction. So if we subtract the bottom reaction, so I like to think of it as adding, adding the, the negative of it. So let's, let's think of it this way. So we have C plus O2 goes to CO2, and then if I add the negative, well, let's just, I'll say minus then, right? Uh, that means that I'm adding the reverse reaction, so CO2 goes to CO plus one half O2. Actually, so I am adding the negative there, right? Because I flipped the reaction already. CO2s cancel out, so I have C plus one half O2 goes to CO. So then I have to do the exact same operations as I did with the reactions for the heats of reactions. So in this case, the delta H, if I call this one, this 2 would be delta H1 plus, sorry, minus rather, minus delta H2. And I would get that the heat of reaction for this particular one would be it's minus 394 plus 283 minus 111 kilojoules. So this is the classic application of Hess's law. Because this is difficult to do, so we're going to do the simple reactions. OK. Now, the next step <coughs> is we want to talk, we talked a little bit about this, but I want to go back into it in a little more detail, uh, the formation reactions. So with reacting systems, when I have a compound, right, I don't know the exact energy that's stored within it. 
So if I'm not dealing with a chemical reaction, right, we could choose our reference state. Then we had to unpack our C sub P calculations to figure out how the enthalpy changed from one state to another. Right? Now the reason why we chose a reference state for the non-reacting systems is because we didn't know, let's say for example, the ground state vibrational energy and how much energy is stored within the system all the way from absolute zero to whatever the temperature and pressure we're dealing with is. Same concept holds here with reacting systems. In reacting systems, not only do we have to worry about all the rotational energy, the vibrational energy, the translational energy, and all the nuances associated there, but we also now have to know how much energy is stored in every single chemical bond, right? which means we have to know exactly how every single electron behaves in the system and how much energy it stores when it's shared and all that kind of stuff. So instead, we're just going to measure it. And to simplify things, everyone has agreed to measure it at 25 degrees C and 1 bar. That is the standard or reference state for reacting systems. Now, that doesn't mean that the system couldn't be built under a different set, but every time that you look up a value, you will see delta H of formation with a little, they call it a knot. I don't know if there's a more appropriate term for that. Or delta H of reaction knot. This means at 25 degrees C and 1 bar. But just as the heat of vaporization changes as a function of temperature, the delta H of reaction will also change as a function of temperature. Because if we look at any, any arbitrary chemical reaction, right, the delta H of reaction is, let's say, the enthalpy of CO2 relative to the enthalpy of CO and oxygen. If I heat the process up, this will heat require energy at a different rate than these two will. And so you're going to have an imbalance of the delta H of reaction. Now, if it takes exactly the same amount of energy to heat up the reagents as it does to heat up the products, then your delta H of reaction is constant as a function of temperature. Right? But that's going to be the exception, not the rule. Right? Everything is going to change as a function of temperature. How much so depends on how different the overall heat capacities of these two materials are. Right, because we're going to be doing these types of calculations and seeing, well, okay, how, is, how does the reaction change as we change the temperature? Okay. So, when we're talking about the formation reaction, uh, it is always going to be at the standard or the reference state. Right? We don't get to choose that because we don't want to go back and remeasure all of these delta H's of reactions. Because these are all measured at the reference state. So unless you want to go back and build an entirely new library, that's why we're stuck with this as the reference state for reacting systems. Now, referring to the phase, that means whatever the phase of material is at these conditions, that's the phase that we have for the reaction. So for example, if we have water, it is Hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas reacting to form liquid water. So in the back of your book and in other thermodynamic textbooks, you will see listed the heat of formation of liquid water, delta H formation of the standard state for water in the liquid phase is equal to minus 285.8 kilojoules per mole. Now for really common compounds, right, this is the standard approach for a formation reaction. But for really, really common materials like water, they'll also show the formation of water vapor, which is different. So in this case, the heat of formation at the standard state of water as a vapor is equal to minus 241.8. What is the difference between these two numbers? It is the heat of vaporization. 
So let's say, for example, I form water as a liquid, and I want to turn it into a vapor. I have to put energy into the system. So I'm going to take some of this negative energy that is being released, and I'm going to have to take it, and I have to vaporize it. So the difference here is the heat of vaporization at 25 degrees C. Right, so it's not going to be the same heat of vaporization that you look up in the tables. Because the heat of vaporization you look up in the tables is at the boiling point. This is going to be larger. So the difference here is delta H vaporization at T equals 25 degrees C, which is approximately 44 kilojoules per mole. Yes? And this is still at the one bar then? The yes. Okay. Yep. Well, so. Uh, uh, yes. Well, so you have, you'd have to lower the pressure to make the vapor. Okay. But not, uh, not entirely true, right? You could still have it just be... Uh, you could still make water vapor just having it be like in air, for example. But if we did want to have pure water vapor at 25 degrees C, then we would have to lower the pressure. But if you, if you vaporize it like, a, like an evaporative cooler, like a swamp cooler, then you could still have water vapor. Right, so another example of a formation reaction. We could say that sulfur, which is going to be a solid at room temperature, plus oxygen, which is going to be a gas, could form SO2, which is going to be a gas. And this will have a delta H of formation of, what do I have here, minus 296.9. So this is another one of our combustion products. Again, it's a really large negative number, which means that these are extremely stable bonds. And so if you look at hydrocarbons, their delta H of formation is going to be much, much less negative. Sometimes they're even positive. Uh, but for all these combustion products here, uh, water, CO2, all massively negative numbers, which means that when you add them all together, you get that these combustion processes are extremely exothermic, which is obviously what we're looking for. Now, when we want to know if a reaction is endothermic or exothermic, the heat of reaction is just all of the heat of formations added together, scaled by their stoichiometric coefficients. Now let's take a look at what we're doing here, actually. So let's go with an example reaction. SO3 plus H2O. I'm drawing it out big just to illustrate something in a second. So we have SO3 plus water going to sulfuric acid. So what we're doing here, this has a negative one stoichiometric coefficient, negative one stoichiometric coefficient, positive one. So the way to think about this process here, and what we're actually doing when we're doing our, our calculations, our energy balances, is, is we are going to take all of our molecules, we're going to explode them into atoms, rearrange the atoms, and then reconstruct our final compounds. So in the case of SO3, we're going to break it up into solid sulfur plus three halves gaseous oxygen for water. We're going to break it up into hydrogen gas and gaseous oxygen. We're going to react all of these individual species. And then we are going to form our sulfuric acid. So this is actually what we're doing in the calculation. And so we can highlight that this is the real path that we're saying the process goes on. 
But even when we write out the reaction like this, we're skipping over all the pathways, right? There's transition states, there's intermediates. Reactions don't just instantaneously snap to the final compound, right? So we're glossing over a lot of the steps even when we write it this way. So it shouldn't be too much of a stretch then to think that we can just totally neglect the reaction, explode everything, and then re put it back together. But Hess's law says that's totally okay. Right? We can 100% we can choose the path that we chose. Now this is a really clever path because this reaction, what is this here? Formation reaction. It's almost the formation reaction. So reverse the formation reaction. So this is minus delta H formation of SO3. This is minus the formation of gaseous water. And this is the formation of sulfuric acid as you Yes? Sorry, so it's minus because you're, <clears throat> you're starting with the compound. And you're yes, it is something. just a definition. So here, this is the formation reaction, going from the atomic species to the molecular species. And so when you do the reverse, then it's going to be the, the, the opposite of it. So if I am adding up all of my delta H's, I have minus formation of SO3, minus formation of water, plus formation of SO4, oh, sorry, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. That's exactly what this expression here is saying, right? Stoichiometric coefficient is minus, minus, positive. So that means my delta H of this reaction at the standard state is minus delta H of formation of the SO3 minus delta H formation of water plus delta H formation of the acid, which is exactly equal to summation of stoichiometric coefficient Same exact expression we have there. So no difference. Now an alternative, uh, let me just get rid of this here. Actually, I'll keep this one. So there is an alternative approach to doing everything. And that involves using the heats of combustion. So in these circumstances here, we're going from the atomic species and we are creating the molecular species. And we use this to come up with our heat of reaction. But there's an alternative called heats of combustion. So the heat of combustion serves two purposes. One, it tells us how much energy we get out of burning something. And two, it gives us another formulation to calculate heats of reactions. But the way we can think about it is, is sort of just a different reference state. And any other products that there might be. So we have all of our standard combustion reactions. And let's say we have a hydrocarbon. So when we, lock, when we talk about heat of combustion, what we're saying is we're going to convert everything into our combustion reaction products that we had seen previously before. If we were to look up the heat of combustion for propane, 
we would be measuring it at the standard state and we could look up some very large value. So the heat of combustion is the heat of reaction of the combustion reaction. One thing that's really important to note is that this is for liquid water. <coughs> I guess to show you this is at 25 degrees C in one bar. Same conditions again. So under these circumstances, water is a liquid. So oftentimes when you are looking at the heats of combustion for materials, for those of you who may be working in the, some of the combustion labs, have you guys heard of the higher heating value and the lower heating value? So a few, a few heads nodding. So this is what they call the higher heating value because you're getting liquid water out of it. Now I suppose, and so the lower heating value is if this is, if this is water vapor. It'll give you a lower number because some of that energy has to go to vaporizing it. Now I guess the thought process behind this is that if I were to run a chemical plant, sorry, or, or, or sorry, a, a, a power plant or some sort of thing where I'm burning a lot of materials, in theory, I could cool the water down and condense it back into a liquid and squeeze a little bit more energy out of the system. In reality, you would never really do that because it's not really high value energy. Right? It's not super useful to have sort of a lukewarm cup of coffee warm something up. Right? You want to have a big temperature difference. And so, uh, but there's two techniques. One's called the lower heating value, which is where this is a gas. The other is a higher heating value where this is a liquid. So when you're purchasing, uh, a coal or an oil or some other fuel to be burning, you actually will look up what its heating value is. So it knows how much, how much energy, how many kilojoules or megajoules do you get out of burning a kilogram or a ton of it. And so these are really important values. Uh, but what we can do is we can take exactly the same idea as the heat of formation and apply it to the heat of combustion. But instead of starting off with the atomic species like hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and so on, our reference state is CO2, water, and sulfur dioxide. So we could also come up with the delta H of reaction for any arbitrary process is equal to the minus stoichiometric coefficient times the heat, standard heat of combustion. So if you want to know how much energy goes on in a particular chemical reaction. You could just burn all the reagents, see how much energy you get out, and you could burn all the products and see how much energy you get out. And then from Hess's law in this formulation, you can figure out how much energy that reaction took place. So oftentimes that might be the easiest way to determine what the heat of reaction is, is if you can burn it efficiently, just burn it and measure how much energy comes out of solution. That's right, measure how much energy comes out of the mix. Okay. So it's pretty similar to, uh, to um, for solving by delta H uh, reaction using delta H formation. Yep, it's exactly the same concept. The only difference is that we've selected a different reference state. Okay, so that wraps up sort of our fundamentals in reacting systems, and this may have been a review for a lot of a lot of us. Uh, so what we're going to move on to now is actually talking about the approaches that we can use to solve for reacting systems, uh, real reacting system balances. Uh, anyway, so this is this has hopefully been a somewhat somewhat recap material uh, from the chemistry course. Uh, okay, so let me just uh, let's move into actual application of this to solve real systems. So for those of you who have looked at the homework, the last problem talks about two different approaches to balancing out these reacting systems. So in the Felder book, they have two approaches and they have slightly different energy balances. One is called the heat of reaction approach. So in the heat of reaction approach, uh, our energy balance simplifies to this. Where delta H can we 
draw this out here so we can have any arbitrary process. Okay. So one last piece of information. Reference state is 25 degrees C and one bar, and this is molecular species. Now, the reason why I go through this methodology, I don't recommend the heat of reaction approach, but I'm going to teach you about it because this is what you probably are accustomed to seeing based on a chemistry class or maybe even earlier chemical engineering classes for balancing processes. So, in the heat of reaction approach, right, let's say, hypothetically, we are performing a chemical reaction at 25 degrees C and one bar pressure. Material enters the system at 25 degrees C and one bar. Material leaves the system at 25 degrees C and one bar. Under that circumstances, our reference states are equal to zero. So this term goes away, and this term goes away. Oh, because your temperature is... Because that, that's my reference state. So if I'm doing this at the standard state, okay, there's no enthalpy coming in and no enthalpy coming out because that's exactly equal to my reference conditions. Under that circumstance, the heat of reaction tells us whether heat is going in or out of the system. Right, so if I have a negative delta H of reaction, that's an exothermic process, I'll get a negative Q because heat will be leaving the system to maintain a constant temperature. If I have a positive delta H of reaction, that means I'll have a positive Q and I'll have to put energy into the system to maintain it at a constant temperature. Right, sort of just the definition of endothermic and exothermic reactions. Now, if I am doing this reaction at a different temperature, what I am doing then is I'm saying I'm going to take all my material coming into the system, I'm going to cool it down to the reference state, I'm going to react it, and then I'm going to heat everything back up or cool everything back down to whatever the outlet conditions are. And so there's a little bit difference then in the approach that way. So in the heat of reaction approach, we're effectively following this pathway where we cool everything down, typically cool. I mean, in theory, you could heat it up, but in general, we're going to be warming. We're going to be at temperatures higher than 25 degrees C for a real process. Go to the reference state, react it at the reference state. Notice I have the little knot there saying that this is a heat of reaction at the standard state of the reference state. Then heat everything back up to the products. So the enthalpy coming into the system is associated with that cooling or depressurizing process and the material out is associated with that step here and then obviously the delta H of reaction is there. Okay, but this is the approach that most everyone here has probably applied in a chemistry class. Right? This is the concept of what an endothermic and exothermic reaction are. Right? If you are performing the reaction at a constant temperature, does heat get released or does heat get consumed? That is just the definition of basically an endothermic and an exothermic reaction. And so what this term here does is it basically just codifies what exactly is going on. Right? This is the mathematical equivalence of doing that process that you see in a chemistry class. Now I want to contrast that with the heat of formation approach. So in this case here, our reference is again 25 degrees C, one bar, or 
but this is now is the atomic species. Now our energy balance is quite a bit simpler. We don't actually care what the reactions are. Right? There is no heat of reaction in the heat of formation approach methodology. So in this circumstance, what we're doing if we have our reactants going to our products, This is, a better, this is actually this is a better way to think about it. So, I'm going to take all my reactants, I'm going to cool them down to the standard state, or heat them up if it needs to be. Then I'm going to explode them into the atomic constituents. I'm going to rearrange all of the atoms into how they should look for uh, the products, form the product molecules, and then heat the product molecules up to the outlet conditions. So typically, this is going to be a delta H heating and cooling. This is going to be your formation reaction. And then the opposite this way. Actually, rather here, it's negative formation reaction. So everything here and up is what we've already done before. So when we had to build enthalpy tables where you chose your own reference state, let's say for a flash calculation, we, all we did was basically this step here. Reacting system adds one more complexity. Add in the heat of formation, and that's it. Yeah? So to be clear, the, the two atomic ones are the same, right? Uh, yeah, no technically so, yeah. So you could draw maybe as one, one, one error there. But these, yeah, these are the same. I just kind of move them around. Yeah. Sorry, so you're saying that you're breaking your molecule up into its individual atoms at that temperature, right? At here, degrees. this one here? Yeah. Yeah, because this is exactly the definition of the formation reaction. Well, the opposite of it. Okay, so then what's the arrow going from the atomic? Here to here? Yeah. It's, it's actually the same. So maybe the better way to do it is this, then, is to go. They're the same, you're just sort of just putting them next to their friends that they're going to be forming with. So, this is the same energy balance that we've been using for non reacting systems, right? And remember, the only really difficult part of energy balances is coming up with the values, right? Because if I gave you a strictly steam table problem, and I said steam enters at this temperature and pressure, and it leaves at this temperature and pressure, how much heat has to go into the system, or how much work can be extracted. That's something that you guys have seen many times over again in a couple different classes. 
So if you have the numbers for the enthalpy, this is just a, a relatively straightforward algebraic expression. Hard part is coming up with the enthalpy values if you don't have esteem tables. So in the case of the heat formation approach, you don't have to keep track of any of it. Right? So the enthalpy for any particular species going in or out of the system, all it is going to be is first you create the compound, then you vary its temperature or maybe you have a heat of vaporization thrown in. Right? It's just a bunch of steps going from the reference state to whatever your final set of conditions are. So that depends on what is the temperature, pressure, and phase of my material in the reactor. But all of those steps are exactly the same as what we've done already for you know, energy balances on a flash calculation, except that one right there. All we're doing is you just add in the heat of formation, and you can basically keep doing what you're planning on doing. So in many instances, like if you're doing a really big process flow simulator software, it might be worth your while to always consider every process as a reacting system. Right? So as long as you're not making any numerical complications or numerical errors or problems, you can envision every single chemical process as exploding everything to the atomic species, rearranging it, reforming it, rechanging the phases and all that. And it doesn't change anything whatsoever. Because if there were no reaction, all the heats of formation just exactly cancel out. If you do have a reaction, then you have an imbalance of these heats of formation, and that makes it exothermic or endothermic overall. But for doing reacting systems following this heat of formation approach, you don't have to change a thing. You can keep exactly the same energy balance. You can use exactly the same formulation. The only difference is when you're constructing the numeric value, you no longer get to choose your own reference state. And you have to choose the reference state of 25 degrees C in one bar. And you just add in that heat of formation. So basically, you just do this over and over again for all the individual species. And that's it. You've balanced your reacting system relatively straightforward. So the difference between these two approaches, right? This reference state is the molecular species, and all of the heat of formation business is contained within this term. But they are algebraically 100% exactly the same. Because if I take this expression here, and I substitute it into summation of out minus summation of in, all of these heat of formations will calculate a heat of reaction. So if you wanted to go through the exercise, substitute this expression into here, calculate a heat of reaction, you'll pull out exactly that formula there. It's exactly the same thing. The only difference is what do you think is the easier one to solve. This requires me to remember a lot more stuff. Again, if it's a really simple system, if it's a constant temperature reaction, and I know the heat of reaction, then yeah, maybe this is the better way to go. Because then I'd have to go back and look up all the heats of formation. But if I'm giving no information and I'm just going to choose one, two approaches and I have access to the formation information, I'm going to go here. Right? So a lot of it depends on what information you're given to choose which of the two methodologies. All right. Any questions? Cool. Have a good week. Work on the homework, please, and uh, keep an eye out for the project. I'll send an email when that's done.